being recorded. Yeah, so uh, this is a summary of the value propagation opt in uh, the Omar JIT compiler. So um, what is value propagation? It's one of our most powerful opts. Uh, it does several optimizations and analyses that you might find in literature <clears throat> all at once. So in literature, it's kind of hard to find something that's literally called value propagation. Instead, you hear references to type propagation. Um, you, you'll see references to constant propagation, uh, range propagation, that sort of stuff. Uh, and VP kind of combines it all into one uh, optimization in our compiler. So our value propagation pass um, uh, propagates information about types for references. It propagates information about uh, ranges of values that a particular int or long can take, um, and all manner of other information that's considered relevant as well. So a couple of examples I'll give of other information. Uh, it propagates around uh, information around whether an object a reference is null or not, or it's possible for it to be null or not. So nullness information is one other piece that's uh, tracked. Um, if it's a constant string object, uh, it tracks more than just the type. Obviously, the type is Java Lang string in that case, but if it's a constant string, it tra tracks more um, uh, useful information like what is the constant value um, so that one can use it later on if there are operations happening on that constant string. Uh, the constraint comes in handy there. So um, really, uh, it's several opts in one, as I said, and so it's one of our most powerful opt, if not the most powerful opt uh, in the compiler. Um, there are several ways of uh, um, getting into the basics, so let, let me start with the prerequisites. So value propagation, as the name suggests, uh, is based on values, and in particular, this notion of value numbers. Uh, which is a well-known analysis. You can um, search for it, Google for it. Uh, value numbering is, is, is a well-known analysis in compiler theory. Um, so the whole value propagation framework is uh, built on value numbering. So um, there's a prerequisite uh, that every opt can ask for certain analyses to be done ahead of time before it runs. And value propagation requests value numbering be done. So in a, in a nutshell, what value numbering uh, does is it um, picks sort of uh, uh, the nodes that uh, are known to have the same value, provably known to have the same value, and assigns them the same value number. Uh, note that um, two values that may be the same um, uh, need not always have the same value number. It's only in cases that it can prove it that it assigns the same value number. Um, so if two values are different, they will not have the same value number. I mean, that, that's kind of the, um, the rough, very intuitive sense I'll give you. So um, value numbering uh, encompasses kind of uh, things like definitions and uses. So, so if you take a value, store it to a temporary um, via a store, and then load it um, several blocks later, uh, it is capable of realizing that it's the same value flowing through all those areas. So it'll give the same value number to the right-hand side of the store, it'll give the same value number to the store, and it'll give the same value number to all the loads that are fed uniquely by that store. So that's the simplest case when uh, value numbers kind of flow through uh, and, and are the same and, and kind of give you this sense that you're talking about the same thing underlying. Um, it has the same properties. Um, I'll give you an intuitive sense for a case when you won't have the same value number, which is uh, if you have an if-then-else, on one side you have a store into t that's value 1, on another side you have a store into t that's value 2, uh, and then you merge after that if-then-else and uh, you do a load of t. Um, it's neither one of those, it, it could be either one of those two values, so you cannot give it either one of those value numbers, you give it another unique third value number, basically. That's kind of what happens in value numbering in that case. So um, that's a very 
uh, Pua Man sort of um, very um, high level way of talking about value numbering, but you can read the theory more behind it in, in a book. I, this is not a talk on value numbering, it's about value propagation. Um, so so that's, um, that's the foundation. Um, another sort of uh, basic concept to get uh, straight uh, in, uh, in our heads before we go too far is um, the different file structure that you see um, for the optimization, like where's what is a question you may have. Um, so value propagation and value propagation common .cpp hold much of the sort of general infrastructure of the optimization. So things like um, uh, how to um, how to merge two lists of constraints and um, how to even iterate over the trees and launch uh, analysis of each node in each tree. Um, kind of all that infrastructural stuff to drive the analysis, to initialize it, to create the object, the, the uh, value propagation object, um, sits in value propagation, value propagation common .cpp. There are a lot of uh, routines there that will, um, I don't think are the best way to um, start sort of reading value propagation code because there's a lot of similar sounding routines there that will confuse you probably. Um, the better way to, I think, get into the code is through uh, VP handlers and VP constraint. Um, those are two other files that are easier to wrap one's head around. Um, VP handlers is a file that has um, uh, basically routines for um, almost all the op codes, uh, in particular the supported op codes from a VP perspective um, where we do something special. Um, for each uh, opcode, um, it's, it's recognized and something is done for it. All those routines are in VP handlers or CVP. So oftentimes you'll um, I'll give you an example, like you'll see a routine like constrain bound check or constrain int load or constraint uh, int store, uh, constrain call. These are all routines, but really there's, I would say, easily dozens of routines there for the many opcodes that we have, and usually they're kind of very, um, uh, very specific, so they're easier to read and wrap one's head head around. That you look at the constraint add, uh, for example, and you know kind of it's got two values that it has to deal with, and it's trying to add those two values and trying to create a new constraint for the added result. Basically, that's what you expect there. Um, if you have a constant value on for both the arguments of an ad, um, it will recognize that again and will say, here's the result of t operating on two constant values. Um, this ad can be folded into a constant as well. And you will see that sort of operation take place in, um, um, in, in VP handlers a lot. A lot of the transformations are done in line, kind of just uh, um, as we're analyzing things. Um, the other file, so this VP constraint file, um, also easy to uh, um, navigate, especially if you look at the HPP, start at the HPP, is, uh, it lists all the constraint classes. So um, uh, that's the fundamental sort of object that's flown around or flowed around by the analysis itself. So when it looks at a node, looks at its value number, uh, and says, uh, hey, this is a, let's say, pick a random opcode here, iconst or something. Uh, there's an iconst node here. It has a certain value number. Uh, let me create an int constraint for it, which uh, is a const constraint, and the value of the const int is five. So it'll put that into the constraint object. It will associate that constraint with the value number of the, the node, and it'll say, I have seen this node, I've seen this value number, its value is blah, represented by the constraint. And so the next time you see that same value number, you can just use that um, constraint that flowed through to that point. So um, to expand on that particular example a bit more, if you have a store which has a const5 on the right hand side, and then a load that is fed by that store, um, then uh, when you get to the load, which is not a constant, uh, you can look at the constraint associated with that value number. It'll be the same value number as the store, which will be the same value number as the right-hand side, which is the const. 
the constraint will say, I'm a constant five, and I'll say, ah, then let me change the load to a constant five right here. Um, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just saying okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, one of the other things about um, value numbers in general that you should know is it's, uh, it's a notion beyond just syntactic uh, it, it's a notion beyond um, syntax. So you can have, um, essentially, you can have uh, x plus 5 uh, and, um, say, y plus 5, where x and y are known to be equal over a particular range, and x plus 5 will have the same value number as y plus 5. So um, that, that's another thing to keep in mind, that this is not just all um, trivial um, sort of use def chains and parent-child sort of things as well. As well. It, 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 is, it, does, it is more powerful than that. Uh, you can have different nodes have the same value number, nodes that don't particularly look alike um, having the same value number. Um, so, um, so yeah, easier to start in VP handlers and VP constraint for sure. Uh, once you've wrapped your head around that, um, your curiosity will be piqued anyway, and that you will see some things there that will probably drive you into the more complex infrastructural pieces that I talked about uh, that are there in value propagation, not CPP. Um, so in, in, let's, uh, let's see what um, uh, you might um, be curious about. If you look at the constraint classes, um, every constraint will have uh, a routine called intersect, uh, it'll have a routine called merge. Um, so these are good concepts to kind of realize first. Um, so an intersect routine or an intersect operation um, on a constraint basically uh, makes the constraint more, um, uh, more refined. So it makes the constraint better. Um, so an example is if you came in um, to an F knowing that x is less than 10, and the if was if x less than 5, um, then going uh, past that if, you can refine the constraint on x. You can say, I used to know that it was between minint and 10. Now that I've seen x less than 5, I can change that to minint to 5 instead. Uh, and the way that happens is kind of based on Taking your original constraint and intersecting it with the um, with with one of with the new operation that's going on right now, the operation that you're analyzing, and as a result of the intersection is a better constraint or more refined constraint um, that comes out. Um, so so an intersection is done sort of as you're going along. So it's almost like a straight line thing you can imagine. You start out with some information and future intersections on top of that initial information that you had, initial constraint that you had, are only making it uh, either better or keeping it at the level that it was to begin with. If you didn't learn anything new, then the original one stays. So, uh, but, but it's the way that you learn progressively as you go along. Um, a merge uh, operation, on the other hand, is invariably uh, headed in the opposite direction. So. Um, it, it's uh, the result of a merge can't be better than what you started with. It can only be worse or the same as what you started. And a typical example of when a merge operation is done is when there is a control flow join point, for example. So in that if then else example, um, let's say you knew that T was assigned five on one side, T was assigned 10 on the other side, and then you merged and uh, came back uh, to a single point in the control flow, well, at that point, um, you know that t could either be 5 or it could be 10. So um, kind of th that's the general sense I'll give you for how merge works. It's like you, you have a, something known on one side for a value number, something known on the other side for a value number, and you combine those two together to um, form a larger range and then kind of propagate that forward. So they're opposite in a sense. Intersects only improve constraints, merge only um, make them um, sort of less specific, so more general. Um, in that example, we get five. Are, are both of these 
uh, only for control flow instructions? Um, yeah, they're mostly only used in that context. Uh, trying to remember if there is any other um, use case for it, and I don't. I don't think there is. So there's things like back edges and yeah, just like if you have multiple definitions of a load, imagine that you would go through all the definitions and look at all the constraints that you know about for the definitions and merge them all together and say the merged value is what I know about a load or a use that is fed by um, that definition. Okay. Which is control flow based uh, in a sense for sure. Daryl, you had um, in the in that example you gave, where we had the uh, merging the, the the five and the ten. Is the result that's produced a range from five to ten, or is it a discrete a set of? Um, okay, that's, so that's a good question. There is a notion if you look in the BP constraint uh, dot HPP, you'll find uh, upwards of a dozen class constraint classes. Um, there is a notion of a merged constraint in that as well. So there's a TR VP merged constraint. And a VP merged constraint would actually, um, is, 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 a, is a set of ranges. So uh, in that case, you could express it as uh, 5 comma 10. You don't have to say 5 dot dot 10. So it's not saying that the, it's, the range is 5 to 10. You are able to express via a merged constraint that it is two distinct ranges uh, where the ranges are really constants. Uh, <coughs> So, so yeah, but but you only can access those multiple ranges if you sort of downcast the constraint into a merged constraint. If you just looked at the merged constraint as it is, um, in fact, the, all of the int and long constraints have particular APIs that they answer to, um, like get low and get high. So get low means what's the low range of the value that you have. High is what's the high range of the value that you have. Now. Um, that's a general um, API that you can call on any int constraint. However, there are specific ints uh, where you can go beyond, right? Like if the constant, I know that low is the same as high without necessarily even calling low and high and then checking the value, there is an int const constraint um, uh, class that you can just use to say, are you, uh, are you one of these? In which case you are um, a constant. Similarly for the range, uh, that you talked about, like if you say, if you didn't downcast it or if you weren't uh, aware of the fact that there are multiple ranges here, you can call get low on the merge constraint, it'll give you five. You can say get high on the merge constraint, it'll give you 10. Um, and and you, you could be misled into believing that the value is five to 10, uh, which is still correct. I mean, it's conservatively correct. It's just not accurate or not as accurate as it could have been. So. Um, the better option there is to be aware that you may be dealing with a merged constraint, and if you are, then ask that question and, and get the different ranges and look at the ranges individually for low and high as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, so same sort of thing. So, so there are int classes of constraints. There's long constraint classes as well. Um, they're basically, as the name suggests, they're um, uh, just for those data types. Um, the address uh, constraint types get more complex. So there's, uh, uh, as I said at the outset, there's many different kinds of information you could flow about um, uh, an a, a reference um, value. Uh, one is, so, so you'll see um, something called um, a VP fixed class a VP resolved class, VP unresolved class. So when you have an, um, a value, um, you, you, um, it's possible to express the type in different sort of terms. One way to express it is, I know it's definitely this type because I've seen the allocation, for example, and I, there's no doubt I know it's of type T. So uh, that fact is expressed through what is called a fixed class meaning it's a T and only a T, not a subclass is not possible. Um, resolved class constraints, on the other hand, uh, could say, I'm a resolved class type constraint of type T. And that merely means that it's a T or a subclass of T. That's all you know. 
Uh, you don't know it's precisely a, a, a T object. So a resolved class constraint, for example, could be created if you are um, doing a cast. Um, if, if you did a cast or an instance of, after that point, you know that it's um, in this hierarchy because you've just checked, are you an instance of T? But if there are many subclasses of T, the instance of doesn't tell you anything about which subclass of T it actually is. Uh, but you still did learn something from the instance of it. Earlier than that, all you may have known was it was an object, but now you know that it's at least a T. And that fact can be used useful on occasions as well to do, I mean, maybe there's another type check on T somewhere downstream and you can eliminate that, for example. Um, an unresolved class constraint is just saying it's unresolved. I don't have a class for this uh, value right now. It may need to be loaded at runtime, but I'll tell you what the name of the type is. So it just kind of flows around a constant pool uh, entry, in essence, which, which is really a string in the class that is flowing around representing the name of the unresolved class. Mm -hmm. So that type is, is one type of information uh, for a reference. Uh, then there is nullness or not, null or not, which is represented through VP non-null and VP null constraint classes. Um, and, uh, and there are other things, as I said at the outset, the example I used, is it a constant string? Um, if it is a constant string, what are the values associated with it? Um, is it a type that is known to pre-exist this method, meaning the type was loaded, guaranteed before uh, you entered this method? Uh, so there's uh, a bunch of um, different sort of constraint classes that represent different properties. Now, uh, one class, one constraint class that you should be um, aware of, uh, special in a sense, is the VP class um, constraint. <laughs> it's not particularly well named because it doesn't really sound all that exciting, but uh, really, uh, if you look at the VP class constraint, um, uh, you'll have several fields in it. Um, one for type info, one for nullness info, one for this or that. So, so all those dis disparate uh, types of uh, information you can propagate for a reference, um, they're all sort of collected together, if you will, in this VP class constraint. So if you know that an object is of type T and non-null, um, you'll need to create a VP class constraint for it to store those two distinct pieces of information in one place, right, um, you, rather than just um, separately flow a constraint for type and separately flow a constraint for um, the nullness. It, it's all put into this sort of almost like this container um, of all the constraints you know from a reference perspective about, about this value number. It's all in one place, so you get it, um, and, uh, and you can extract out the individual parts from that. Um, so pay attention to VP class. Um, it, it's a little bit special in that sense. Um, maybe I should pause there and see if there are any other questions on what I'm saying so far. Uh, no, you're doing great in my opinion. Yeah, I don't have any questions so far. Okay, um, I'll keep going then, I guess. So, um, do is there particular areas that uh, you guys want to know more about? That's another question to get settled early on? Or is it just the overview that you're after here? You can look at the specifics um, later. Yeah, I think the specifics can be done later. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, maybe perhaps <coughs> just uh, describing the, um, how the, um, how it actually works with the separation. Of the ah, right. So, um, that's a good point. So um, one of the so when I said that value numbering happens before the optimization is done, so value numbering analysis is done. It associates a value number with each node, and there's a um, sort of a data structure created for value number info that is uh, that is around. It's hung off of the compilation object or the optimizer object. I forget. It's hung off somewhere. Um, now, as we are doing the optimization value propagation, 
um, we are not um, updating the value number info. It is what it is to begin with. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful because um, in some cases we are doing transformations. Um, in certain scenarios, we will end up changing the trees ourselves, right, as we are doing the optimization. Um, so you don't want to change the tree, add a new node, for example, which didn't have a representative in the value number info that was computed up front. Um, because if you did, then um, uh, you may, uh, value propagation can iterate around a loop, for example. It may analyze a single block more than once. So let's say you went through the block the first time. You created a bunch of nodes that are new at that point that were not represented in the value numbering. Then you came around and analyzed that same block a second time. Now you have in your hands a node which doesn't have any value numbering, and that would trip up the analysis, or that's not that's not good. It expects every node to, every relevant node to have been sort of tracked through value numbering and, and having a representative there. So there are certain transformations that are quite trivial. For example, going and removing a null check, for example, because you can prove that the object is not null. Um, you don't really need to create a node. If at all, you're kind of blanking out a node. You're changing a null check to a treetop. Um, so that's fine. You're not creating a new node. That transformation can be done in place. Um, you can go and change a load to be a constant or change a sub to be a constant. Again, that can be done in place because you're not creating nodes. You're just transmuting a node that already exists and it had a particular value number anyway, and surely the value can't change uh, because of value propagation. So um, you're maintaining the property in essence through some transformation. But there are other transformations that it does, uh, kind of a, an important one, but also um, uh, an obscure one to start with is uh, changing system.array copy calls into uh, our own IL representation, which is uh, an opcode called array copy. So that is done in value propagation. Uh, and I, I don't think we should linger on the reasons why that's suitable to do in value propagation. Suffice to say that all the context information that's available in value propagation from all the constraints makes it practically the best place to do that transformation. Um, but creating an array copy node is obviously a, quite a drastic step. You're um, expanding out what was one tree into potentially multiple trees representing uh, various checks that have to be done. Like if you look at the system.array copy API, for example, um, all sorts of exceptions can come out of system.array copy, like array index out of bounds, null pointer exceptions, type could mismatch, this or that, right? So it's actually quite a complex operation represented by the call, and that operation is broken down into individual steps when we lower it into our own opcode. Um, so there's the array copy tree itself, but before it go the host of checks that need to be done in order to uh, safely do an array copy if all those checks pass. So, um, so yeah, so, so we're creating nodes in numbers there. Um, who's gonna assign value numbers to those num nodes? Um, uh, one answer as well, just give them a new value number that doesn't match anything else and get on with life. We could have done that. Um, possibly would have even been uh, uh, a better option. I, I won't use this opportunity to get into the pros and cons of it. What we did do is um, for those kinds of uh, non-trivial transformations, we have uh, deferred transformation steps, so to speak. So value propagation says, uh, I'll just add the system array copy call to uh, a list and we will process the list once we have completed the analysis of every block for the last time. So once we are done with the analysis completely, a queue of transformations has been set up. You go and process the queue of transformations and do whatever transformation you need. Uh, it's all safe at that point because nobody is looking at value numbers anymore. The analysis is already concluded. Um, you just go and create a bunch of new nodes, invalidate the value numbering at that point after the optimization is done. And this will result in it being rebuilt later on once uh, someone else needs it. Um, so that's kind of what is um, uh, tactic employed there. 
Um, so you'll see a routine called do delayed transformations, which will be in either value propagation or value propagation common dot CVP. It'll be a gigantic method because it has these uh, uh, n different kinds of transformations that uh, need to be deferred. They're all kind of deferred there, and, and it sort of goes one by one and says, ah, if you're in this list, I know what to do. If you're in that list, I know what to do. If you're in this list, I know what to do, and processes them one by one and uh, does whatever needs to be done. So, um, so that's a subtle point. You might be wondering why it's adding to a list in the middle of this handler. Why can't it just do the transformation? And it's because of this somewhat subtle and fortunate issue with uh, not having the ability to just spontaneously mock up value numbers as we're going along for new nodes. Um, uh, what else are so so maybe we should walk through the flow of how things run so that you have a better idea of that as well. So um, value propagation itself can be run in two different modes. Um, the important high-level point: the code base is shared across these two modes. So there's local value propagation and there's global value propagation. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the CPP files, the, the core value propagation CPP files you will see separate perform routines, one for TR, um, global value propagation, colon perform, and one for TR, local value propagation, colon perform. But they're both, as I say, they're derived out of the same um, base class. They share all of the handlers. They share uh, all of the constraint code. Um, so what's the difference between local and global? Local runs um, at the scope of one extended block at a time. If blocks have been extended already, if blocks have not yet been extended, because that itself is an optimization that happens uh, in the middle of the optimizer, typically, or a little bit after the midpoint when blocks are extended. Before that, it's just dis distinct basic blocks. Um, so um, there is no extended block. Therefore, local VP operates one basic block at a time until block extension is done. After that, if you run local VP, it'll run one extended block at a time. Um, the, the limitation of local VP is that, that it will forget all the constraints that it knows about uh, once it's done with its unit, which is uh, one block or one extended block, depending on where you are. There's no constraints flowing in at the start of its unit of work. Um, so you only know what you know from analyzing that one block. Um, pretty, uh, that, that's uh, obviously less uh, powerful than global value propagation, which um, um, does uh, transmit constraints across block boundaries. Um, as the name suggests, it's global in scope. Uh, that means, of course, in a JIT context, whenever we say the word global, it means within one compilation scope. Um, there's no notion of across compilation scopes. Nothing is propagated there. Um, but global is across basic blocks in the method that you're compiling. Um, you have um, information being propagated across blocks. So um, in, in, the, in the case of uh, local value propagation, you don't even really need to do value numbering as such, because within a block, um, the identity of a node is well established. You don't need to, say, assign value numbers. Um, uh, local CSC will common up um, different accesses that are to the same thing, and you will have one node kind of uh, representing a particular value within a block anyway, uh, if it's just repeated. If, if you load X twice, there's no store of X in between. Uh, local CSC would have commoned that up to a single load of X anyway. Um, so, um, so you just use node identity. That's your value number. In, in, in local value number, local value propagation, the, the get value number API essentially is just a sham. Um, uh, in local value propagation, if you say get value number, all it does is let me give you the node's global index, which is just a field sitting on the node, is returns that. Um, so very um, cheap to run, which is why it exists. Uh, it is run several times, um, even at cold. It is run, I think, more than once. Definitely run more than once at warm. Um, Global value propagation, on the other hand, requires a global analysis. It requires use depth, requires global value numbering. And then it itself, of course, is accumulating constraints as it's going along through the method because it's propagating across block. 
So um, some of the constraint lists can be quite long. Um, some of the um, uh, operations, therefore, can take more time because you have to, if you say, uh, find me the entry, the constraint for this value number in your current list of value numbers. Well, there's 10,000 value numbers that you're carrying constraints around for at a given time. Let's say you have to go through that list and find your entry and pull it out and then use it. Whereas within a block, within local value propagation, maybe you only have 100 entries flying around, so easier to just find your entry. So everything is faster in local value prop, but also it's not as effective as, uh, as global is. Um, but as I said, the handlers are all using the same code. Um, the only traces of global versus local you will find are in a couple of queries that are that don't even make it all that, um, that, that aren't in your face. A large majority of the code is not actually dealing with global versus local in places like PP handlers. You'll find the odd reference to, I think it's like underscore is global or something is the name of the check that you'll see from time to time. Um, but it's by no means littered all over the place. Most of the time, the operation you need to do is, it is what it is, whether it's global or local. You just look at the constraints and you do what you have to do. Doesn't matter where where they came from. But there are occasions in which you need to recognize if you're in global or local, and there's a check for that. Um, loops are handled specially in global value propagation. Um, in fact, um, <laughs> there's a there's a particularly dark corner of value prop, um, which unfortunately I do have to talk about. I feel even in the first uh, uh, presentation on it, uh, which is um, this notion of um, store constraints versus normal constraints, um, and um, um, what's the best way to talk about this? So so. Value prop as a whole, if it doesn't know something about a particular value, it doesn't create a constraint for it. So the lack of a constraint means that you don't know something about a particular value number. That's the convention used in value, num value propagation. Um, this saves some memory as you're going along. You don't need a constraint that says know nothing, right? You don't need to allocate a constraint to know nothing. It's just implied. Um, However, um, for um, stores, um, because you could be dealing with loops, um, you may not have analyzed all the stores that could feed a particular load when you hit the load. So let's say you're walking forward through the trees as the analyses do, even global or local, it starts from the first tree and starts to make its way down. But it knows when it's inside a loop. And when it's looking at a load, it says, um, so tell me what your depths are. And let's say it's a simple sort of induction variable type scenario. So you're, you have i uh, being incremented in the loop. So i is equal to zero outside the loop. Then you increment it, meaning i plus plus inside the loop. And you're using i inside the loop to do array accesses or whatever. Um, you're at the load of the i inside loop. Uh, the first time you get there, you've only seen the i equals zero that was outside the loop. You haven't yet seen the i plus plus. Um, so you need a way to say, wait a minute, don't fold this away right now because you ha there are depths that are unseen at this point. Um, so it uses the fact that a store um, constraint for I++ hasn't even been seen yet um, as a sign that uh, it hasn't analyzed it yet. Um, so, so for stores, even if you know absolutely nothing about the value of the store, so even if I++ said, I, I just have no idea what this resulting value is. It could be min int to max int, any value in between. Um, you still generate a store constraint for that store um, saying I know nothing, which is kind of what we were trying to avoid in the general case, um, just to represent the fact that yes, I have seen that store and I have analyzed it. And so you can sort of um, take into account the fact that it has a null constraint, it means I know nothing, and you have to make the load conservatively know nothing as well at that point. So um, this is a point that very likely is too subtle for this stage in the discussion, but I, I'll say it one more time and then move on from it, is the, the presence of a store 
like the fact that you've analyzed it or not needs to be flagged. Uh, and it cannot be flagged if, uh, if you have this notion of the constraint may not even exist if I know nothing about the value. Even if you know nothing about the value, whether you've seen the store or not, needs to be flagged to the analysis. And if you're interested in why that is, we can talk about that offline. So this is why you will see store constraints being talked about in the value propagation, CPP and common CPP dot uh, files. Um, just for stores, you will have two types of constraints, created a normal constraint and a store constraint as well. Um, now, um, on this sort of topic, I, I think there's also another sort of basic thing that uh, I should know, which is uh, constraints come in, um, obviously there are all those different types of constraints that you'll see in VP constraint or HPP, but there's also uh, conceptually there's two different kinds of constraints. There's what is known as absolute constraints and there is relative constraints. So absolute constraints are, I know what the value is, I'm t or I'm telling you something about the value. So in saying that a value is const five is an example of an absolute constraint. Saying that this reference is a new of this type is an absolute constraint. Um, even saying that I, uh, this I is in the range five to 10 is an absolute constraint. Um, a relative constraint on the other hand is a constraint that connects one value number to another value number. So it's like, it isn't saying something about this value number in the sentence or in the conversation is another value number. So you ha it's like saying, I know that I plus one is one more than the value number of I, right? So I, I plus one is one more than the, the value number for I plus one is, has value that is one more than the value number for I, right? Um, so that is those kinds of relationships and also things like if you see x, if x less than y and neither x nor y are constant, it's to say that on this path, I know that value number for x is less than value number for y. Um, so fundamentally, there are two value numbers involved. That's what makes it a relative constraint. Um, so, so those kinds of constraints are also created as we go along. It's not just absolute constraints that are relevant. Um, it, it is. I mean, you could be doing if x less than y once and then repeat if x less than y and you want to be able to fold away the latter um, occurrence even though you have no idea what x and y are, but you do know that x is less than y. You've checked that once, so you, you want to propagate that fact. Um, so that's the difference between um, relative and absolute constraints. Um, there's also a notion of uh, global constraint uh, versus uh, not, a non-global constraint, um, also known as a block constraint, I believe in the code, it refers to it as a block constraint. Um, a global constraint is one that is just going to be true throughout the method. So you don't need to propagate it um, through every block in every list for every block. Um, so let's say you saw in the very first block, you saw i equals five. Um, now after that block, it ends in an if, uh, it's got two successor blocks. Um, rather than propagate a value saying it's this value number is five along this edge and also this value is five along that edge, the two successors and then carry that information around in two different blocks. Why bother? You know that the value is five, nothing's gonna change it. It's a, con it's a constant node. You may as well just stick it in one list somewhere and that's the global constraint list rather than having copies of it floating around. Um, so it's really nothing to get intimidated about. It's just a short form single place for um, certain very um, trivial and simple types of constraints to go into um, and not have any copies floating around. So you'll see that sort of global constraint list being touched as well on occasions. Uh, there's nothing to um, worry too much about. So um, getting back to the global constraint flow of things again. So you come through the, um, uh, typically, if you're outside a loop, you're going to be analyzed once, whether you're talking about local value propagation or global value propagation. If you're inside a loop, you'll be analyzed twice, essentially. You'll go through, because there is this notion of have I seen the death or not. Um, so you'll need to go through the first time 
see all the defs that there are in the loop, put them into a package constraint list, um, and then use the package constraints list the second time you're going through the loop, uh, saying, oh, have I cached something for this value number on the package constraints? Yes. Okay, let me put you pick it up from there and, and use it. So um, uh, blocks inside loops and therefore nodes inside loops are analyzed twice. Um, and everything else is analyzed once uh, outside uh, loop. Um, this fact is expre uh, expressed in the code, oftentimes a query called last time through. So you may see uh, VP last time through or, or last time through as being the API that gets called to say, am I looking at this node the last time, is, which I know we're second time if you're inside a loop. If you're outside a loop, is, is that returns true even the first time. So, so yeah, you're just making a forward traversal over the graph, over control flow graph, over the blocks. Each node, you're going bottom up as, um, as you would in pretty much any analysis in our compiler. You would go child first, analyze it, work your way to the top, and then move on to the next tree top. Go child first, work your way to the top, follow control flow edges, um, and really kind of think of it as a as a forward traversal through the entire control flow graph. Um, what do we do on uh, except for exceptions? Right. Okay. So okay. So that's another concept. Uh, actually, I don't. I don't even know how much you are familiar with exception edges, but let me just talk about that a bit. So um, exceptions are everywhere in Java. Um, null checks, bound checks, div checks, check cast um, are all accepting things. Calls can throw exceptions to. Um, Rather than have uh, individual little blocks chopped up at every place where there's a call, where there's a check, and express it explicitly in the control flow as an if test, um, what we chose to do early on was to keep them as check nodes, which are not like if tests. So there's a null check node, there's a bound check node. The bound check isn't expressed as two ifs, comparing the lower and upper bounds. It's just um, a single node. It doesn't break the block. It keeps the block longer, and going for longer allows the local optimizations to be more powerful um, rather than have to deal with a bunch of little chopped up blocks with no opportunities to do local ops. Um, however, it is true that control flow can escape that block at this exception point, right? Each one of these exception, point, exception points is a place where um, you could get out of the block. Um, so a null check could fail, and you could end up in a cache block. A bound check could fail, you could end up in a cache block. A null check could fail, and you could leave the method entirely if there's no cache block, and so on. So this fact needs to be expressed somehow. Um, so it gets expressed via a single exception edge from a block to its cache block. If there is, if there is a cache block, um, and not all methods require you to de declare a cache block, um, but if there is a cache block, um, You'll draw an, an exception edge from all the blocks that are in the try to that cache block, representing the fact that exceptions are possible here. I could be going from block A to block B via an exception event. Uh, that needs to be expressed in the CFG somehow. Um, but because we didn't blow it up into individual blocks, the burden is then on the analyses, the data flow analysis engine in, uh, in the compiler, as well as ops like value propagation, that are walking trees, they need to sort of uh, take into account that exception edge every time there's uh, a check, for example. So uh, let's say value prop is walking forward, hits a null check, um, it needs to pump uh, the constraints down to the cache block as it was at that point, at the null check, because that may be the point where control actually goes to the cache block. So it needs to send those constraints as they are at that point. Let's say after the null check, then uh, two trees are later, there's a bound check. Um, it needs to look at the constraints at that point, which may have changed uh, slightly because there were intermediate trees in between the null check and the bound check. Um, uh, it needs to look at the constraints at that later point and now flow those in to that um, exception catch block as well. So essentially that will be a place where a merge operation happens. So the list of constraints that we had from the first point, exception point gets merged with the list of constraints at the second exception point, and that becomes the 
uh, constraints flowing through to the catch block, uh, and so on and so forth. As it's walking the block at every exception point, it'll take the current um, constraint list and merge it um, into the inset going into the catch block that is the exception successor. So it's essentially kind of, it has to model these n different program points as reaching the cache block itself as it's doing the analysis, because in the CFG there's only one edge representing it. So, so it does n merges as it's going along, and at the end of the day, the right conservative value is present at that cache block, representing the fact that you could come there from here, 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 or here, all the different checks that are there in that block. They're all points that would take you there. Um, yeah, so does that make sense to you guys on the phone? Um, make, uh, anyway, in the last few minutes of the call here, so maybe I should just pause and ask for questions, unless that was so wonderful that there are no questions. Uh, from me, uh, I think I got a good overview of uh, value propagation. I also have to go pretty soon, so let's stick around too long. Yeah, I'm just starting to understand. So that was a good overview for sure. Yeah. The, the okay. last bit is a bit confusing to me. So, um, so basically, we're trying. You're trying to say that uh, all the constraints has to flow to the catch blocks. Is that? Um, if you have um, a block inside a try region, so let's say you're talking about Java, let's talk Java code for a second. So you say try curly brace some code and curly brace, and then you say catch some exception, start curly brace, and do something when you catch that exception, right? That's the Java syntax for try catch. Um, so obviously there's code inside the try region. It could be several basic blocks could be a lot of different ifs and loops and whatnot. Um, so there's a, CF, there's a part of the CFG that's inside the tri region, that, that's for blocks that are inside the tri region. Every one of those blocks will have an exception edge to the cache block, okay. representing the fact that control, if there is an ex exception thrown from any place in this tri region, it is capable of reaching the cache block. The edge does not say that you will definitely reach there. It represents merely the possibility that you may reach there. So, um, so an edge is there from every block, imagine, in the try region to this cache block. Now, as you're walking through uh, each basic block, um, there could be multiple check nodes in each basic block, um, because we don't break a block off when we see a check node. You can have several checks in there. Um, each one of those is a point where Control flow can be transferred from um, the the try block to the cache block, um, and so you need to be able to represent that fact, right? The constraints that are flowing into the cache block. I mean, the cache block is just more code, right? It's just IL um, there as well. You need to accurately capture what is the state that is flowing into the try into the cache block, and in order to do that, you need to merge all the constraints from all the points, um, all the different exception points, um, individually you need to merge them again and again as you're going, uh, um, th that they could be flowing into the catch block. Um, because there's only one edge otherwise from the entire block. What point are you going to flow constraints that are coming through that block into the catch block? Is it at the start? Is it at the end? That could be the confusion, right? Because you only have one exception edge. And what I'm saying is, it's not at the start, it's not at the end. As you're going through, you flow a constraint every time you see a check uh, that could take you to the catch block. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yes. 